Star Trek is the story of humanity, who we are, where we're going, and what we can do to get there. It's the story of Earth, centuries in the future, in which most social and economic hierarchies have been abolished through a combination of legal mandates and a cultural revolution that created a cultural evolution. Social hierarchies such as racial supremacy, patriarchy, and pervasive heteronormativity are largely relics of the past. Economic hierarchies such as capitalism and class itself have been abandoned in favor of a more horizontal distribution of power, divorcing labor from reward in such a way that effectively eliminates poverty. If money as we know it effectively does not exist, then housing, healthcare, and food are essentially free through the science fiction version of mutual aid, or labor vouchers, called Federation Credits. Workers of the world, unite! You have nothing to lose but your chains. Even if a portion of the human population chooses not to work and opts to take advantage of the system, a combination of automation and the significant portion of the population that does choose to work more than makes up for that. Few people really want to do nothing their entire lives. A permanent vacation sounds tempting, but it is paradoxically exhausting, not to mention unfulfilling. With the removal of economic consequences to their lives, humans are free to pursue whatever path they wish without much concern of failure. Not everyone has the skills to be a doctor, but everyone can now afford medical school. Aristotle famously said, Poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. Without poverty, social unrest and crime barely exist outside of the crimes we commit against one another for personal reasons. Due to this marginalization of crime, the modern centralized police as we know them today do not exist in the 24th century, the implication being that this incarnation of the police were abolished. Law enforcement and security is conducted through highly specific organizations with highly specific training. The Department of Temporal Investigations is a bureau of the United Federation of Planets that conducts inquiries related to time travel law. I guess you boys from Temporal Investigations are always on time. Starfleet Security, sometimes called Federation Security, conducts inquiries related to Starfleet officers, crimes on Starfleet installations like ships and space stations. Starfleet is only mobilized on Earth under extreme circumstances, and even then, with a great deal of controversy. Anything resembling a police officer is rare, and usually only exists in an alternate timeline. Incarceration still exists in the 24th century, but prisons as we know them have been abolished with actual rehabilitation centers in their place. These rehabilitation centers are devoid of cruelty, and convicts' sentences are not particularly long either. Capital punishment has been abolished as well, unless you plan to go to Talos IV, but that's not really a thing anymore. Students receive free education and study advanced topics at an early age, preparing them for adulthood as well as keeping them out of trouble. Crime on Earth is not resolved by increasing law enforcement. Instead, crime is resolved by decriminalization, education, and solving societal problems that lead to crime, criminogenic conditions. The state still exists. But with nearly all other social and economic hierarchies abolished, the state's control is severely limited and far less egregious than it is in the real world 21st century. So much, in fact, that it might be challenging to compare it to what we presently consider the state today. There are inconsistencies with this structure due to how many episodes and series of Star Trek there are, and nobody needs to point that out, but these are the basics. So. How did any of this happen? Well, here's where things get weird. In 2026, World War III happened. Nuclear weapons annihilated much of the population. In 2063, a scientist named Zephram Cochran invented the warp drive and made a ship out of an old missile. The warp attracted the attention of a Vulcan ship. The ship landed, Vulcans and humans shook hands, and the future was set into motion. The Vulcans helped guide humanity toward making better decisions, and after some time, they didn't really need the Vulcans calling the shots, and they were being real mean to Jonathan Archer's dad anyway. Humanity stumbled forward, you know, like a baby gazelle or something. I don't know. Watching Star Trek isn't simply escapist entertainment, although it is definitely that too. Star Trek episodes are often fables, and much like the more traditional fables, Star Trek is not subtle. 
It has a specific thing to say. Star Trek is a vision of a hopeful future with lessons about how we might behave in our time in order to achieve something resembling this future. Executive producer Rick Berman famously did not believe that something resembling the Star Trek future is possible. I don't believe the 21st century is going to be like Gene Roddenberry believed it to be, that people will be free from poverty and greed. He also remarked that writing Star Trek simply means buying into the idea anyway because you have to write that world, it's your job. But those who watch Star Trek often do buy into that idea, not because it's their job, but because they think it's possible. They want that future, the optimistic future. The lessons in Star Trek have genuinely shaped the values of a great many people. This sounds preposterous because, in reductive terms, Star Trek is simply a product. A successful product worth billions of dollars, earned through advertising, movie tickets, and merchandise. Star Trek is such a popular product that it alone can be enough to keep an entire streaming platform afloat. What was previously called CBS All Access, and now Paramount Plus, had little original programming to speak of when it launched, but the promise of new Star Trek convinced a sizable portion of the viewing population to subscribe and stay subscribed as more and more Star Trek was developed. Star Trek gets spin-offs. A lot of them. Even Star Trek fans who don't like the new Star Trek shows keep watching the new Star Trek shows. This is because even though Star Trek is a product, it is not only a product. Star Trek is something for people to believe in. So to hell with Rick Berman. It's his fault Jadzia died anyway. In fairness, nobody knows what the future actually will be, but if we don't imagine what a better future could be, then that future will be unimaginable. Those who do not believe in the idea of Star Trek often cite human nature as the reason why a better future for humanity is not possible, that our allegedly selfish nature will prevent us from saving ourselves. You know, like a scorpion on a frog's back or something, I don't know. However, anthropologists say there isn't so much a human nature as there is human culture. If the behavior of humans were exclusively predetermined by a fixed, universal human nature, then our social values would be largely identical to that of early Homo sapiens. Remains of primitive Homo sapiens date back as far as 300,000 years ago, followed by anatomically modern Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago, and Homo sapiens with the modern brain shape about 100,000 years ago. Even judging humans by, say, the past 3,000 years, change has been enormous, and it did not have anything to do with a changing nature, because the biology of Homo sapiens has not changed significantly in this comparatively short amount of time. Evolution is much slower than that. In other words, if so-called human nature has not changed in the past 3,000 years, but social values have changed enormously, then much of these changes must be attributed to culture. In fact, even if there is a human nature that impedes progress, it clearly can be overcome given enough time. The social values of humans, as well as the structure of society and technology of humans, have changed so much that life 3,000 years ago would be unrecognizable if we were to time travel back there, and life today would be unrecognizable if someone from that period could time travel to us. If the culture of humanity has changed so drastically, then the culture of humanity can change even further in the future. Not all change is good, but it would be naive to claim that humanity is unchangeable. Second, if the behavior of humans were exclusively predetermined by a fixed, universal human nature, then our social values would be nearly identical from culture to culture in the modern era. All social values in, say, India would be identical to social values in the United States. All social values in Ireland would be the same as South Korea, and so forth. Third. The social values among differing people within a nation would also be nearly identical, but we know that's not true either. In short, there is clearly a tremendous amount of variation in what we believe and how we structure our societies. The claim that there is simply no way to overcome a social or economic hierarchy because of some inherent selfishness contained in human nature is just not backed up by anthropologists, historians, sociologists, or biologists. 
endless studies show the positive effects of altruism on the human body and mind. Society simply could not exist if Homo sapiens were naturally selfish or incapable of overcoming selfishness. This is not some amateur opinion, it is the contention of every field that studies humanity. As Peter Kropotkin once said, Competition is the law of the jungle, but cooperation is the law of society. Believing that humanity has the capacity to overcome our current predicaments and create a much grander and more compassionate world is often called radical hope. Philosopher Jonathan Lear defined it as the denial and refusal of cultural vulnerability. Radical hope is about adaptation, the willingness to see the loss of the current culture as a positive if it brings about a better culture. This should not be confused with escapist hope the assumption that everything will inevitably be resolved. After all, the Vulcans are not coming to save us. Radical hope is not escapist because it demands action in building and rebuilding the culture. Combined with the technological achievements of today and the future, there is no real reason to believe that humanity is simply incapable of achieving something resembling the Star Trek future. This was said in a previous video, but to reiterate, if you want to change things, find a cause you believe in, find an organization that focuses on that cause, and join that organization. The solution is to organize, either in pre-existing anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and anti-fascist organizations, parties, and unions, or by developing our own. We cannot simply elect a completely different way of life into office, and therefore must develop and popularize a political counterbalance I too succumb to ennui about the world, but the answer is not apathy. The answer is hope, and doing something with that hope. I hope everyone liked this episode, and if you appreciate what I do, you can click on the subscribe button or click the Patreon link.